Welcome once again. Thank you all so much for being here this morning at what is the second ever plenary session at ABSICON devoted to education. And for that, I'd like to give a special thanks to Mary Wojtek, Steve Desch, and my fellow members of the Scientific Organizing Committee. Yeah, right on. So my name is Daniela Scalise, and I'm the education lead for the astrobiology program at NASA. I and my co-conveners, Melissa Curvin Brooks and Eric Melchior, from whom you'll hear in a moment, uh, extend a special welcome to our panelists, our speakers, Victoria Plout, Gerhard Sonnert, and Richard Pitt. They are all social scientists actively working on issues in increasing diversity in education and in the workplace. We're very grateful for them for coming out, making the trip all the way out here today to share their knowledge and wisdom with us. All right, so our theme today is astrobiology education in a diverse world and toward a better one. Our aim is to inform, inspire, and empower you to embrace the vision of an astrobiology community that is stronger and more whole through diversity and to take action to realize that vision. For those of you who were at the last APSICON two years ago, at the first ever education plenary session, you may remember that our charge to you there was to weave into your professional scientific identity the valuing of and participating in education and outreach. So we echo that here today and charge you to weave in a commitment to expanding diversity for our community. We recognize that each of you is different, different backgrounds, different institutions, different disciplines. And we hope that the information that's shared today will provide you a foundation from which each of you can work perhaps in a different way, perhaps in unified ways, uh, toward a more diverse and equitable future. And reminding you that you already know how to do this really, really well. You're astrobiologists. And you don't, we don't do, astrobiology can't get done without diversity in disciplines. So this should be inherent in you already. And of course, hopefully that makes the leap to embracing diversity of people that much easier. So today, again, through the session, we invite you to take a fresh look around you at the diversity landscape, if you will, uh, at programs like Equal Opportunity, at ideas and perspectives like color blindness. Are they effective? Uh, are they perpetuating stagnant status quos? And as and, and while it's important to look around you, external to you of what's going on, we think the key to this journey is probably internal. And so we invite you to think about your mindset and embrace your potential to contribute to potential solutions. And together, independently, in a unified way, we should be looking at the paths forward. How can we push boundaries and explore new models toward this better world? And of course, should any of these explorations and ideas lead you to be uncomfortable, then get uncomfortable. It's okay. My education colleagues like to tell me that when you're uncomfortable and you're confused or irritated, then you're about to learn something. So hang in there and you will, and we'll get through it together. Okay, that's it for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. Good morning, I'm Melissa Curvin. I'm from the, I'm the staff scientist at the Astrobiology Institute. Um, at the 2002 ABSICON, before I was part of the NAI, um, Barry Blumberg, who was the first director, and Karen Bradford, who was the program analyst of the NAI, looked around at the community and noted a lack of diversity. Um, so out of this uh, program was developed, the Mayor's Program, Oops, sorry, we were there. Um, to, with, with the goal of increasing diversity in the community by providing opportunities for faculty members to um, collaborate with researchers um, who were astrobiology funded. At first they were NAI uh, funded labs and it was expanded to the whole astrobiology program. Um, I have flyers available for anybody who would like some more information on the on the program um, if you're, afterwards, if you're interested. Um, 
Uh, starting in 2008, we, uh, we scheduled sessions at AvSciCon devoted towards looking at um, education, at um, astrobiology education in minority-serving institutions. And it's just wonderful that we have this opportunity to talk to the whole community here today in this plenary. After the elections at the end of um, this, this past year, I heard from a number of people in the community asking how they could um, help, to, help to improve astrobiology um, diversity, um, which was a timely request and it fit in quite well with our plans uh, for this meeting. At the Science March um, this past Saturday, I, you know, I was just, you know, I, was, I, I looked around and I also, tried to identify the number of diverse people in the, you know, marching with me. And, um, you know, there were some concerns there. Um, so right now I'd like to uh, invite up Eric Melchior, who is one of the past Mayor's Fellows. He was a fellow, he's, our, he's a co-convener of this session, and he is also a Mayor's Fellow in 2008 and in 2015. Um, in 2008, he was at the University of Hawaii, which is actually a Native Hawaiian serving institution, and in 2015 at UC Riverside, which is a Hispanic serving institution. And he himself is at Cal State um, San Bernardino, which is also a Hispanic serving institution. So, Eric? Thank you, Melissa. So I'm gonna start off with a personal narrative here. You see, I'm uh, Native American through my mother's side of the family. And I was raised on stories told by my grandparents, uh, stories of the Miami and Potawatomi people, stories of uh, how Dragonfly got his long tail, and the historical accounts of the forced relocation of the Miami people being forced to leave their native homes in Indiana and Ohio and taken down to uh, Florida where they were forced to work to build canals that drained swamps so that cities could be built. One of those cities you might be familiar with because it still bears the name of the Miami people. Now, I found as a young person I was uh, terrified of this heritage and I hid. I hid behind the Italian last name of my father. And it was quite easy for me. And why did I hide? Well, one reason was the overt racism that you see in this country. Um, it permeates everything. And sometimes it's, it's hard to see if you're on the outside looking in. But I found myself not wanting to be uh, held up as a caricature of my true self, the caricature which you probably see uh, around you even to this day, emblazoned on football helmets with exaggerated facial features and on baseball jerseys. There's also a more subtle form that it takes, and that is the idea that you can be robbed of even your own personal accomplishments. And I didn't want to have people say, well, look at where he is, that's because He's Indian, and he must have had a leg up somewhere along there. And the idea that you can rob someone of their own accomplishments or sense of accomplishment is a devastating thing to someone. So I hid until the last year of graduate school when I had kind of a cathartic moment and realized how morally wrong it was to hide because there's so many people who can't. And so I made a very conscious decision to uh, seek employment right after my PhD at a tribal college. That's hard. And if we can move forward, let's see here. Where, oh, here we are. And it's hard for a number of reasons to work at um, a minority serving institution which may not have the resources of a large R1, and where work with the community and work with outreach and diversity is valued. Um, there's this misconception that people who do outreach and diversity efforts are not good enough to pursue an academic career. And this is something that 
many of you probably would shake your head and say, well, I know that's not true, but uh, it's something that lingers down there uh, in people's minds. Why did somebody pursue this? And this can actually negatively reinforce some stereotypes when somebody who has come through a path themselves uh, and then decides to help those behind them finds themselves in this kind of uh, self-fulfilling prophecy that their work is not valued as much as a result of the direction that it's taken. And people see that. And there's also the informal sanctions, which are referred to as the Sagan effect. And I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Sanjoy Sam, who uh, I hope is in the audience here. Uh, at the last uh, ABSICON in Chicago, gave a wonderful uh, presentation at the education plenary. And uh, the Sagan effect, of course, uh, uh, Carl Sagan being one of the founders of astrobiology and with a stellar research record, you would think that he uh, would have been an, a shoe in for the National Academy. But uh, his work in diversity and outreach uh, kind of worked against that. And so it's something that we can fall prey to. The reality is that scientists who do engage with the community and with diversity efforts actually perform better academically. And there's research uh, that Sanjay and others have, have done into this um, that have shown this. In fact, some of our most uh, productive scientists and active scientists actually are doing much of our STEM outreach. And so there is uh, a reason to value what we're doing if we can overcome this, this bias towards these programs. And towards this end, I would argue that if you uh, think that education and outreach and diversity programs are fluff, um, try talking about your research to a room full of third graders. Because if you can't do that, you need to look inward and evaluate whether you truly understand what it is that you're doing. Lastly, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we have with the students themselves. And this is an emerging uh, trend. And it's very prevalent at Cal State University San Bernardino, where we had a self-study that we did. And we found that 9% of our students are homeless. And that 21% of our students uh, have food insecurity, which is defined as having at least one meal a day where you don't know where it's going to come from and that you probably skip it for that reason. And I put some headlines up here uh, because this is such a staggering fact, it's almost hard to believe that this could be going on. But it even extends beyond uh, institutions that are serving poorer communities dominantly. There's even some larger universities where this is becoming more of an issue. Can I see a show of hands from people who know this is occurring at their university? Yeah, and here's, here's the problem. Try explaining to a classroom of Native Americans who live on a reservation in abject poverty why they should care about astrobiology, let alone study that. Again, that is hard. So I encourage you to listen to the presentations you're going to be given by our speakers here and see what you can gather from their knowledge on this subject. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who will be introducing the speakers. Thank you. Our first um, speaker this morning is Dr. Dr. Richard Pitt, who received his PhD from the University of Arizona. I hope that's OK, since we're so close to ASU. but. Um, um, he received his degree in sociology, and he's focused his research on religion, education, and social psychology. His current work is funded by the National Science Foundation, looking at persistence and attrition from postdoctoral academic careers. Let's all welcome Dr. Pitt. Thanks, Melissa. Good morning. This is why I don't teach early morning classes. I, I'm never quite sure I'm awake. Um, let me go ahead and get a sense of when my time limit is up. Um, so I'm always encouraged when I'm talking to a group 
with this many people, especially at 8.30 in the morning, um, around diversity because my work in undergraduate and graduate admissions has taught me that essentially there are three different kinds of, of people. There are, uh, especially faculty, there are the color insensitive, so the people who don't want you ever bringing up race and diversity um, in the sciences. There are the color sensitive, the people who are, you know, where I always feel like I'm preaching to the choir because um, they already get it. They're all signed on to the agenda. Um, and then probably the, the larger group, ultimately, of faculty are the color blind, who, for good reasons in, in lots of ways, would rather, you know, to be fair and to, to, to sort of spread the wealth and not to be considered racist, tend to avoid thinking about color. They want to do it, but they tend to just say, I'm, I'm colorblind, I don't see color, um, color probably shouldn't matter. And what always I have to remind them is that colorblind attitudes don't always lead to color neutral outcomes. And so it's really important for scientists in particular, because this is the group that I always find having, I don't have to argue with sociologists, I assure you, about whether or not diversity matters. It is often the natural and life sciences um, and the physical sciences who are always like, it, it shouldn't matter. And so I'm always very encouraged that people show up for these things in a science context, because it means that somebody other than the sociologists um, care about these issues. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> barriers to diversifying STEM. Um, as I was talking to the, to the group of us, you know, this isn't going to be totally Pollyanna-ish. Um, it's not going to be a whole lot of, man, this is easy. Just get out there and do it. And I'll just slap you on your butt and send you out to diversify astrobiology. Like, that's just not how this <laughs> works. And so um, I think I'll leave you with more questions, I think, than answers. But I hope that at the end of this, you'll learn some things. Um, so first, let me talk about sociology's problem. So sociology, as a discipline, uh, students tend to take our undergraduate courses, and usually at their first encounter, unlike with the, sci with the natural and physical sciences, uh, sociology, the first time they sort of encounter it is when they come to college. And so they sit in our classes and they love it because we're, we're doing, solving social problems and unlike economics, that other social science, you know, and psychology in some cases, we don't quite look like a science because there's not that much math. Um, and then this other issue around, you know, we talk about big things that students care about and they're like marching about racism and sexism and heterosexism. So students love being sociologists while they're in undergrad and then they say, oh, I think I'm going to get a PhD in that. That sounds really cool. And then something happens when they encounter us, the same me that they had as an undergrad, they encounter me as a graduate faculty member. And they're like, who are you, dude? Right? <laughs> And so one of the things that I often have to put in my letters uh, for graduate students, or prospective graduate students, is a statement like this. One of the tendencies that I've seen in both undergraduate and graduate sociology students is a sometimes alarming streak of do-gooderism. That is, many students enter this discipline because they want to change people's lives or eliminate all equality in the world. And so they encounter, they come to graduate school and promising students drop out of our pre our programs to pursue world-changing options outside of the academy. So I always have to then tell people like me who are admitting uh, students we've all taught um, that while Carla, in this case, holds some of these values, I'm quite convinced that she plans to fulfill them in her scholarship and her teaching and actually pursue what we are training her to do ultimately, which is to be an academic scientist and not drop out and say, especially at the masters often, and say, I don't want to do this because this isn't quite what I thought science, this particular science was. And so what I find again and again is that what we do is a great job of teaching young people to love sociology, the science, but we don't ever really do much of a good job of teaching them to love being an academic professional scientist. And so I want to talk about that by thinking about whether or not astrobiology has some of the same problems. So in terms of numbers, you certainly have a problem. Uh, Dorita Holbrook says of, 90, of nearly 600 faculty at the top 40, I'm so not used to having, this is like church, having the PowerPoint thing there. Um, of nearly 600 faculty at the top 40 astro programs, 42 are Asian Pacific Islander, seven are Hispanic Latino, six are black. It's pretty bad. 
for a discipline. And, and this isn't like astrobiology, which is interdisciplinary, which should sort of expand. This is just astronomy and physics. And so we think, oh, but, but what we're doing is we, we get students really excited about science by showing them some really cool black and brown scientists, right? You know, we list them up there, usually uh, ast astronomers and um, astronauts. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really hard to then turn them on to astrobiology because even these people don't walk around and introduce themselves as astrobiologists. Uh, you know, they introduce themselves as astronomers and um, physicists and uh, what's that other thing? Uh, astronauts. So, so, so I think all, in some ways, what this kind of problem that I think we have in sociology, where people encounter people like us all the time, right? They take our classes, but they have no idea what in the world we do in the real life, except sort of the magic tricks of science, right? And then they encounter trying to be and follow us as professional scientists, and they say, oh, I, don't, I don't think that's what I thought this was. So what I want to talk about is essentially how we do a good job of developing a science identity and then talk a little bit about how it is that we undo or don't fully develop in student, students what I think is more important at the end of the day and that is a professional identity as a scientist and not just an academic identity as a scientist. So I want to talk really briefly about identity, um, how you get an identity. So we'll talk about science identity. So, so when we think about how you have an identity, like who you are, there are different parts of it um, that I as a social psychologist and a sociologist tend to think about. And so they're listed here. One is identity prominence, one is identity salience. So identity prominence is this thing like where you walk around in the social world and this is an identity that you have that is really, like when you think of who I am, this is an identity that you think is who you are. So for me, certainly, sociologist is one of those identities. But it, it's also this interesting dynamic around uh, in our survey, we ask, when you introduce yourself to a new person, what kinds of things do you say when you say, hi, my name is Richard Pitt and I am, right? The kind of things I think for people in my generation, us old people, um, we put in our match.com uh, profile and you young people put in your, your uh, what do you call them? Uh, I don't even use them. Tinder uh, <laughs> profile. Right? The kinds of things that you think is important for somebody else to know, that is, an, is a prominent identity for you. The other thing is this idea of identity salience, where that's an identity, and again, it's a component of identity, where the identity is so strong that when a new situation or a new decision, is the way I like to think about it, comes into play, which of your identities is the one that actually is making that decision? Right, and so uh, for me, when I'm walking uh, to the mall, when I started at Vanderbilt, I used to go to the mall very casually and not have to worry about it because I was just new guy in Nashville. But after teaching there for many years, now I'm Professor Pitt, so I can't go to the mall anymore uh, because students are like, what are you doing here at the mall? I can't go to the club anymore. What are you doing here at the club? I can't be on, on Tinder anymore. Dr. Pitt, what are you doing on Tinder? <laughs> right, and so, this identity has grown in me over time to the point that it determines my decision making, right? In ways that aren't even, um, you know, at the sort of front of my mind. Sometimes it is unconscious. And so how do you get these identities? How do you get this identity um, prominence and salience? It's affected by role commitment. So it's affected by the number of people who know you as a holder of that identity and treat you as a holder of that identity. And then also your own sense of belonging to the group of people who hold that identity, right? And so another question that we ask in our surveys is if you could not hang out with other sociologists or you could not hang out with other bio, uh, astrobiologists, would you be sad. When you leave and, not, and when you leave the conference, the Abscicon conference, do you feel just a little empty when you get back on that bus and go back to your campuses or your regular jobs? Right? Because then what we're trying to understand is how many people interact with you as a holder of that identity? And therefore you become it becomes more salient, becomes more prominent. And then how attached are you to that identity? And if you are if it's both prominent and salient what we argue is that you are going to seek opportunities to actually perform that identity. And an important one of those ways of performing that identity is performing it professionally. 
right? So if it's something inside so strong, it is an identity that is so strong in you, what we argue is that you will seek out opportunities to be an astrobiologist, to operate as an astrobiologist, to do astrobiology, and probably the best way to do that is to have to do it eight hours a week, um, eight hours a day. Who does it eight hours a week? <laughs> eight hours a day as a professional scientist. And so what's great about STEM programming, the McNair program, and SACOMA, and other things, student organizations that students do, and having uh, high schools of science and that kind of thing, is that it does a great job at the early stages of inculcating in people, young people, black and brown people, women, some competence and self-efficacy as a scientist, but they're also interacting with people who are like, hey, you're a scientist, I'm a scientist, let's all do science together. So at the end of the time, at the end of Going to uh, IMSA, for example, in Illinois, people are like, I can't imagine doing anything but going to undergrad and being a scientist. And then we have them be a science major where you're always around scientists. I can't imagine doing anything but being going to a PhD program to be a scientist at the end of those four years. And so certainly STEM programming, certainly STEM programming does the kinds of things that a person like me that's concerned about how a science identity blossoms in a person, STEM programming at all these levels does a great job of doing that. It increases prominence and makes these identities, the science identity, more salient. Okay? <clears throat> and so that's great. Oh man, Dr. Pitt, you seem to have solved the problem. More science programming at the high school level in the college level. But we have a problem, and that is that people don't, people don't just encounter, once they start graduate school, as I said, students come to Vanderbilt and they say, oh man, I love all this sociology, but then they encounter me and say, now you have to take our two semester stat sequence. And then we spend weeks and weeks and weeks where we show them research that only has an R squared of point 0.2. And the students are like, oh, that's not explaining anything. We're not going to solve anything using that model. One of our students in every single, whatever model I put in front of her, she's always like, that model is flawed in all these ways because it's heterosexist and it's racist and it's not feminist. And the whole kind of thing is just a flawed model. And then we're like, OK, I guess there's not a whole lot that we can learn here. And so that's one of the things that happens. So when we're thinking about what the barrier is, one of the barriers is students encountering us as professors when they're getting their PhDs in our disciplines. They love science until they are graduate students in science. And they say things like this, I really enjoy taking care of and interacting with people. Doing basic science doesn't give me that like I hoped. Maybe I'll get a career in anesthesiology, which led me into science at the first place. Or I've been doing research since I was a sophomore, and my PI, who is my role model, seems to love research but keeps getting her funding request denied. The science is solid, they still say no. Uh, watching that process is disillusioning. Or there's the intersection of, of the science identity with other important identities to people that they develop not when they're freshmen in college, they develop as grown-ups when they come to us in graduate school. My life changed, I'm now married and had a child recently, and I see the advisors, often female advisors I've had whose family lives are below average and don't want that. I know I can do something else and be intellectually challenged without working constantly and still lacking job security. So at the end of the day, the barrier, I argue, is that we teach students to love doing science, especially at the high school, the K through 12 level and the, high, and the college level, undergrad level, but we don't do a whole lot in terms of teaching them to love the idea of being a professional scientist. And I would argue they have fantasies about what we do as professional scientists, because they see us being brilliant and smart and funny in the classroom twice a week, but they don't see what happens when I'm sitting in my office the other six hours a day right, until they become graduate students. And they're also sitting in my office with me six hours a day, right? <laughs> and, so, and so I have sort of three questions that I'm trying to think through as a scientist, as a social scientist, trying to understand what actually hinders the development of professional science identity. And I think it's a problem for sociologists, it's a, prob a problem for astronomers, astronomers uh, for physicists, I always want to say uh, physicians, and um, for uh, astrobiologists as well, and there are these three things. A, 
academic professional culture? And this is a hard question. What do we faculty model about further training requirements, work tasks, occupational prestige, funding opportunities, and job satisfaction, things that students don't encounter before graduate school often, that may make academic careers unappealing? It could be that the reason why we can't diversify astrobiology is because people have too much proximity to us. Right? Social relationships. Is it enough to have similar student peers like you have often in undergrad or again in STEM charter schools, but few similar people who look like you, professional family role models, laboratory and thesis advisors, and postdoctoral mentors? Is trying to train students at places where the people aren't writing grants, trying to train people where people don't have an entrepreneurial research enterprise because they mainly teach science, are those the best places for us to be growing the science identity and people who ultimately we want to be like us, at, often at R1s, um, et cetera, at sort of doing pure science where the resources wind up enabling them to do that. And then thirdly, really this idea of intersectionality, and that is, do other important social identities that we just sort of say, why, that shouldn't matter, but we really need to consider the intersections and the relationship of this in actually hindering um, science identity, professional science identity development, is do other important social identities, racial identity, religious identity, is often a big issue for people wanting to be scientists, particularly scientists that would argue that there might be life somewhere else that God had the audacity to not tell us he put there. Um, social, economic, and familial identities that interact with science identity in ways that decrease the kind of commitment that I talked about to this identity, and therefore are others more prominent, and do they become more prominent as people develop in other ways that actually uh, serve as a, as a hindrance ultimately to the development of the science identity in terms of wanting to be a professional scientist. And so, again, no answers necessarily, but certainly I've sort of given you some tools and some things to sort of think about, ways to sort of think about the challenge of this, and then hopefully my colleagues will, will tell you all the good stuff, which they're not. They, they, we're all in the same camp. This is hard. Um, uh, to think about how we can do this, um, and not, not just how we can do it, but that it can be done. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Gerhard Stonert, who is a sociologist of science at the Science Education Department of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and an associate of the Harvard Physics Department. He's conducted several large empirical studies on gender aspects of STEM careers and on STEM education. Welcome, Gerhard. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be at this astrobiology uh, conference, and I appreciate the invitation. I'm a sociologist of science, and uh, sociologists of science uh, have been studying the development of uh, um, specialties in science extensively. So that's kind of what we do. And uh, it might be interesting for members of this specialty, uh, who I know are very much focused on the origins of life and its development, uh, to look at the origins and the development of your own discipline. Um, there are a few stages of institutionalization that subspecialties and specialists go through uh, predictably. Uh, there are some milestones that I put on the uh, on the overhead like conferences, this is one of them. Uh, associations, you have one. Uh, journals, you have them already. Uh, so, so these are things that are about the organization of communication. And subspecialties organize different boundaries around uh, communication. And, and these are the institutional vehicles by which you accomplish that. And you have done so. The other things are kind of in the future of this field that uh, probably don't exist so much if they exist at all, like uh, getting a degree in astrobiology or finally having a department of astrobiology at, at some university. And once, once that has been achieved, then you have arrived. So then, then you're no, no longer a little growing specialty, but you're, you're a, 
uh, grown specialty. So, so what, what does that mean? How does a subspecialty develop? And the, the interesting thing is that we hardly ever find a subspecialty uh, developing in a linear form. There is typically a phase of rapid growth. The uh, development of specialties goes in a logistic curve. There's a slow beginning. Then there's this critical phase of rapid growth. And then it, it kind of levels out again. And what, what I think you are at is this critical phase of rapid growth. And this is important. This is the time you will remember well. Because a lot of switches have to be thrown now that will affect what's going to happen later on. So choices have to be made, and you have to be very careful about how to make these choices also in relationship to uh, diversity integration and so on. This is another thing that uh, sociologists pay more attention to than maybe scientists or people in that specialty, and that's the distinction between cognitive leaders and organizational innovators. Often this goes hand in hand, especially as a new subspecialty develops. It's just one person that both makes scientific contributions and, and kind of tries to, to hoard the colleagues the few colleagues that do the same thing together. Uh, but as you grow, there might, these two functions might come apart, and, and my advice to you is value the organizational innovators. This is not what's usually done. I mean, the, the currency, the, the coin of the realm is, is, is information, is knowledge. So, so the cognitive leaders are the ones that everybody looks up to, but there's this critical function of getting you organized, which uh, somebody has to do, and these people should be appreciated for doing it. So now this is, uh, um, I've specialized on women uh, but uh, in, in uh, science, but I'm trying to say this about both women and underrepresented minorities, which to some extent are similar, to other extent uh, to, uh, to some other extent are different. So um, first, I want to talk about blatant obstacles. Everybody knows about them, discrimination, harassment. Uh, we wish that did not exist anymore, but it does. People who are from the astronomy community probably are aware of a few cases recently that were highly publicized. So, so this, is, uh, this is an ongoing problem. But uh, from a sociological point, even more intriguing are subtle obstacles. And these will be even more enduring. And the, uh, the root of this is what we call in sociology the stranger problem. Uh, what does it mean to be a stranger in a culture? To, to not know the culture, but to come into it. And, and there are micro-mechanisms, things that are not that obvious as harassment or as discrimination, but tiny little things that go on in day-to-day -day interactions. And, and it, this is uh, dependent both on the natives, what the natives do, how the natives treat the strangers, and how the strangers act. So there's, it goes from both ways. And uh, like what Richard said, identity, that's how, how the stranger feels. Does the stranger feel he or she belongs in that strange community? And then, of course, the, the treatment that the stranger receives from the natives. And if the natives are smart enough, they don't blatantly discriminate, but the outcome will be similar. So th th there are several uh, socio uh, psychological mechanisms that are really well researched. And, and you could look them up, it's like unconscious bias that people have stereotype threat, implicit association. So it, it, it really ma makes a difference if you're a stranger in a culture or a native in, in, in the culture. This is a phrase that's heard very often when people want to change things. This is about women. Probably the same thing applies to uh, 
uh, underrepresented minorities to, uh, should we fix the women to fit into the existing system or should we reform the system to be better? And of course, the correct answer is we should fix the system, right? Every, everybody says so. But I, while I agree, I, I want to uh, um, point out, or, or my take on this is, this is not a dichotomy. Uh, you don't choose fixing the system or fixing the women. And, and the reason is time scale. Uh, the, the time scale of a individual career is measured in years. Like you're graduating, you need a job this year, next year. The time scale of, of, of institutions, it's institutional change is me measured maybe in five years, 10 years. So, so there, there might be a situation where you have to be pragmatic. You have to tell the minority or the woman how to survive in, in an unfixed system because the alternative would be to have to leave. So, so I, I think these things both have, uh, both go together to some extent. Now, there's a thing where women are different from underrepresented minorities. One is critical mass. Women occur naturally in the population at about 50%. So that means it's easy for them to, to be well represented. And uh, in sociology, we know that the perception of a group changes depending on the proportion of, of, of the membership. So at some point, people accept a group as mixed. And, and it's not quite clear where this percentage is. Uh, some studies say it's as, as, as low as 10% are the go up to 25, 30%, but it's this perceptional switch to say, ooh, there's a woman, what's the woman doing here? To, yeah, <laughs> women are all over here. Uh, that's, we, we're a mixed group. And, and that's, of course, easier for women to achieve than, than for underrepresented minorities. So uh, the, the flip side is family obligations. That's, of course, something that is more connected to, to, to the women than, than to underrepresented minorities, and uh, this is, uh, there's a clear perception that having children or family obligation is something that holds women back. To some extent, research has supported that, but not as clearly as, as the urban myth says, and, and we actually haven't found it to that extent, and uh, that was a study where we asked, I think, the right question. It was an interview study, and we didn't ask how, how did having children or being married hold you back in your science career, but we asked what effects did being married and uh, having children have on your science career. And then we got very complicated stories from both the men and, and the women, and the, uh, the obstacles connected to family obligations are so obvious, they have to do with time and energy that you have to kind of take care of the kids. And so that, that's in the foreground. But then the stories you get about the benefits are more socio-emotional. Like people feel happier. And that's, that's harder to measure than, than the, the, the time that uh, is spent on, on family obligations. So it's, it's un, yes, family obligations are a problem, but they are not the whole problem. And family obligations, cannot be blamed for the lack of diversity in, in a science. Because that's, that's the easy way out. If you say, well, women have children, so they can't be that successful as scientists, it's not our fault. It's just the way the world works. So if, if you look at unmarried women, if, if you look at uh, uh, women without children, I mean, that's, they're not doing perfectly well either. So it's not just an issue of family uh, obligations. So this is the, the one point of advice I want to give you in astrobiology, and that's based on studies in graduate school uh, that my colleague Mary Frank Fox at Georgia Tech did, and my own case study that I did about a large research institution in STEM. And that is uh, clear and explicit criteria help. It has to do with the stranger. You have to know the rules. And 
Um, science, of course, is not something that does routine work a lot. I mean, it's almost by definition, science does unexpected things, does, does new things, so it, there has to be flexibility. So, so what, what comes up is a, a culture of um, deal making. And if, if, you are an, uh, if, if you're an outsider, you don't ask, you don't make the deals, you just don't do anything. So, so if, if there's flexibility, it really, um, at, it, it really helps the natives who know how to ask, who, who know how, to, how to ask for exceptions, who, knows, who say, well, I know we usually don't do that, but please do that for me. And if, if you tell women and, and minorities exactly what's expected in graduate school, this is what you need to do, then they can do it. Just don't uh, think they will figure, that, figure it out by themselves. So the, the point is not turning people away actively from a science doesn't mean you attract them. So we asked what, what, what makes people choose the careers they want to have. And so we did a study on a, a kind of a rating study on what's on career outcomes, what's important for you in a career. And uh, these are all items that, that people could rate in importance, time for family, time for myself, and so on. And we classified them into four different uh, factors. The work-life balance factor, the extrinsic factor, that's like fame, money, and so on, the pioneering factor, and the people-related factor, working with people and helping other people. And, and this is what, what happened. Uh, the, the red dots are the, oh, the, the axes are not shown. So the, the, the y-axis is uh, um, fame, money, and status. So the higher it is, the more fame, uh, status, and money people want. And, and the x-axis is working with other people. So all, all the men are on, 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 on the upper level. They want more money, they want more fame, they want more status than the women. Just, uh, th um, and in terms of working with other people, there's a difference. And the difference is uh, uh, predictable by intended career. So the, the engineers, sorry, the engineers, very little interested in other people. Uh, these, are the, <laughs> these are the males. The, the female engineers a little more, and it's always to the right and down for each profession. So in each profession, the, the young women want more, uh, want, want to help other people more than, than the males. Interesting what happens with the uh, race ethnicity, and, and this is, uh, these are um, coefficients for multivariate regressions, and it, we found that black students and Hispanic students wanted to have more of everything. Uh, so uh, we normalized it, in, 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 we took out the, the, the mean ratings because they always kind of on the paper go to the right side uh, and if you take out the mean differences, all the differences go away. So uh, there is, if you, if you subtract the main, the mean difference of like wanting everything more, then there's no difference by race. So this is like how it starts and we go back to the origins like I guess you like to do. Uh, our origin is middle school. So this is what, what minority, uh, what students were interested in middle school, beginning high school, end of high school and beginning college. Um, black students at the bottom, Asian students at the top. Interestingly, Hispanics. Hispanics were very interested in STEM at, uh, at middle school, but then they, they lose interest. This is what happens in biology. Also a general decline uh, Hispanics, very strong in middle school, uh, declined black students, uh, consistently uh, least interested. That's what happens in astronomy. And, and this is to show you that the astronomy is, is one of the STEM disciplines that crashes the most from middle school to, to beginning college. So this is uh, remarkable how, how 
how strongly kids are interested in astronomy in middle school and then how it declines. You might say this is a good thing because there are not enough jobs. But, but still, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how, how, how the, uh, what happens in astronomy. The, the silver lining is that astronomy is kind of the gateway drug into other STEM uh, disciplines. We found that people who move out of, uh, who move out of astronomy the larger part moves into other STEM disciplines. So you could say, okay, astronomy is not something that's a big discipline, but it serves as the gateway for kids to go into other STEM discipline in which they then have, can have careers. Okay, with that, I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerhard. And our last speaker this morning is Dr. Victoria Plout, who is a social psychologist and a professor of law and social science at the University of California, Berkeley, School of the University of California School of um, Law, and is the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion. So some of her research interests include diversity and inclusion science. Welcome, Dr. Plout. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me and all of us. Um, I've already learned so much uh, this morning, and I think my comments will complement what's already been said in the previous presentations. Um, to kind of honor Dr. Pitt's um, uh, comments about ident identity uh, prominence, uh, I am Victoria Plout, and I am a social psychologist. Um, I think that to start, uh, to start, I'd like to, um, well, just to give you an idea of the roadmap for the next 15 minutes. So we're going to start by looking briefly at a graph that shows us who populates um, not necessarily astrobiology, but science and engineering PhDs globally. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about three assumptions that get in the way of trying to rectify some major imbalances. So in terms of the um, uh, global PhD, so these are PhD uh, percentages of women and men completing PhDs uh, in science and engineering in 56 countries that uh, the NSF was able to collect information from uh, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the percent of total PhDs granted in that country. Um, the women are in teal and the men in orange, and the solid circles are science and engin engineering PhDs. The other circles are non-science and engineering PhDs. So I know that these are probably too small to read for much of the room, um, but I just wanted to point out where the U.S. is right here. So I'll let you take that in for a minute. Yep, it's the one. It's the only one that stands out. Uh, that's um, has an outline right there. Okay, so for all of these to the left of the Ukraine, which is at parity, uh, there's a gender imbalance with more men getting science and en engineering PhDs, and to the right, there are more women in those those countries getting science and engineering PhDs. And one reason I wanted to show you this is just to kind of remind us uh, what we're up against. Um, but also, uh, it, I think the graph shows that the th this imbalance is not inevitable because clearly some countries um, are uh, experiencing the imbalance in, in the other direction. Um, we could also look at rates of participation um, by racial groups within the US. A lot of other countries don't collect that information. South Africa does. Uh, disability is another one, and socioeconomic status. But in the interest of time, um, I'm going to move on and um, uh, talk, whoops, there we go. Okay, 
Um, so there are numerous reasons for these imbalances, and we're not going to get into them today. Um, but given the interest that's been generated in terms of trying to correct some of these and address some of these imbalances, um, I want to take you three, through three assumptions and social psychological work um, that, uh, that shows three assumptions of how um, diversity and inclusion, how diversity and inclusion assumptions can often get in the way of correcting those assumptions. So the first assumption is that the best way to be fair and inclusive um, is to ignore differences. And this goes back to something that Dr. Pitt was saying earlier about colorblindness. Um, so earlier in my career, I conducted some interviews in a large multinational bank. And in particular, I was interviewing a manager who was in charge of a large international department with 50 countries represented. Um, the people in that department spoke 25 different languages. And the project was on diversity, and in particular, uh, diversity in, conf in different ways of approaching conflict. So the manager walked into the room where we interviewers were sitting, and he um, put our proposal down on the table quite forcefully. And he sat down and he said, you know what? This is great but I don't have any conflict in my department. And we thought, hmm, okay, well, interview over. You know, we should just leave, and this was in New York. We could go back to California. Um, but we, we thought, well, gee, you know, there's 50 different countries represented in this department. Huge, there's got to be some conflict somewhere. What's going on here? So we, we pressed a little. We said, well, that's very interesting. Why, why is that the case? And he says, people are people. We're, dif we're different but similar. I don't see a person as being from this culture or that culture. Instead, I see them for who they really are. And then he went on and explained that um, he was raised to be colorblind and that uh, he believes that people are all the same and that's how you should treat people. So then uh, they brought in uh, some of his subordinates um, who came from different backgrounds. So one of them was black, another one was Asian American, and another one was Latino. And they had very different things to say about diversity and conflict in their department. Um, the black woman spoke about um, how the fact that uh, race wasn't raised as a topic or was taboo as a topic meant that discrimination get, got swept under the rug, was unrecognized and unacknowledged. Um, the Latino uh, spoke about how he really wished he could be himself more at work. And the Asian American woman talked about different work styles and different management styles that she felt weren't um, appreciated. Um, so the, the point is that some people make the assumption that you should treat people as if difference doesn't matter, while others see things very differently. Now, does this have implications? Um, the, um, uh, my colleagues and I con uh, conducted a study in a large healthcare organization that consisted of scientists and doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals. And we conducted a survey where we asked people a variety of questions, including what they thought about diversity. Did they take a more colorblind stance towards diversity? Did they believe that diversity should not should be ignored? Um, or did they take a more difference acknowledge approach to diversity and felt that, that differences should be positively acknowledged um, in organizational diversity efforts? We also collected information about the psychological engagement of the employees because we know that psychological engagement predicts things like absenteeism and productivity and turnover. And then what we did was we looked within the departments and we aggregated the attitudes that the dominant group held, the white group held in the, de in the departments. And we aggregated, um, so we aggregated their attitudes towards diversity, whether they took a colorblind or a more difference acknowledging approach. And then we aggregated the engagement scores for the employees of color. And we looked to see whether there was a relationship. And it turns out that there was. Um, the more that whites in a department held colorblind attitudes, the less engaged the employees of color were. The more whites in a department held more difference acknowledging attitudes, the more engaged the employees of color were. Uh, and we found that this was mediated by perceptions of bias. For example, in the colorblind, more colorblind departments, the employees of color uh, felt that there was more bias. Now, this is a correlational study, um, but several studies by other people suggest possible mechanisms. Um, and they suggest that unconscious bias, which Dr. Sonner uh, uh, brought up earlier, and conscious biases may be at play. So for example, 
Uh, in one study, white college students read materials arguing for either a colorblind uh, stance or a more multicultural stance on trying to improve racial harmony. Now, they didn't read it whilst lying on the grass. I just thought that this was a fun picture to show. Um, and then they gave them an implicit association test to measure their implicit biases. Um, and then they also gave them a self-report measure of prejudice. And what they found was that those given the colorblind material beforehand expressed more implicit biases and explicit biases in a pro-white direction. Other studies, whoops, other studies suggest that this prescription to avoid or ignore uh, difference ironically increases both nonverbal and verbal prejudicial behavior. And in one study, the directive to white interviewers to ignore difference actually caused the white interviewers to sit further away from black interviewees. Um, in another study, they gave people this prescription of a colorblind versus difference acknowledge approach to diversity and then measured the cognitive depletion or cognitive exhaustion of the students of color who were interacting with those students, with the white students who got the colorblind or difference acknowledged instructions. In that particular study, which was conducted at Princeton, these were African American and Asian American students. And it turns out that the students were, whoops, there we go, that the um, students of color were more cognitively exhausted after conversing with white students who had been, based, who had been told to be colorblind. Okay, so, um, that's a lot of research that suggests that um, a focus on colorblindness can have ironic consequences that we need to be aware of. So is the answer to just focus on difference? No, and I wanna be very clear about that um, for some of the reasons that were actually enumerated earlier by my colleagues. Um, it's important to create conditions where people feel like they can be themselves and treated fairly and where it's okay to talk about difference and where race and other differences are on the table, but it's not okay to pigeonhole people or stereotype people. And there's research that suggests that if, suggests that if diversity messaging makes people think that they're only there, they've only been selected because they add to diversity, um, then that harms their engagement, especially in low representation environments. Um, so in sum, attending to diversity is complicated, but avoiding it altogether is not the way to go. Okay, assumption number two. Um, everyone experiences settings like educational settings in the same way. Um, we look out of the classroom, we assume that people are experiencing us, say, as professors in the same way, and they are not, and they are not experiencing each other in the same way either. For underrepresented students, belonging is a key driver of participation and sometimes even performance. So in one study, um, in one study, um, the uh, experimenters randomly assigned African-American and white first-year college students to read testimonials from older students about um, having felt that they didn't belong when they started college, but now that they were older, um, they felt like they had belonged. They had grown confidence in their feelings of belonging. Note this wasn't about academic skill, it was about social belonging. In the control group, they just read other material. It, it was unrelated material. Um, and what they found was this one hour reading of these testimonials, just this one hour manipulation, reduced the racial achievement gap over the course of three and a half years in GPA by 52%. Another issue that is related to belonging is the existence of stereotypes about science. Um, so what are some stereotypes about scientists? Any ideas from the audience? White males, very good. Yes, there's the picture. Um, white males, geeky, always working alone, um, not, necessarily solving, not necessarily solving problems, just doing uh, science for the sake of science, as one of the earlier quotes said. Um, so we, in our research, um, we wanted to examine, in particular, the stereotype that computer science is geeky. 
And um, students came to the computer science building and they completed a test and a questionnaire in a room that we had decorated either with objects that were pre-tested as stereotypical or non-stereotypical. And I'm gonna show you what that means in a moment. Okay, so here's a stereotypical room. <laughs> Star Trek poster, sci-fi books, Coke cans. And here's the non-stereotypical room. Uh, nature poster, uh, neutral books, and water bottles. Note that some of these items came from my house, but I will not tell you which ones they were. <laughs> Um, they, so they, they took the, the questionnaire and the test in, in this room, and uh, what we, one of the things we asked them about was their motivation to pursue computer science as a major. And what we found was that um, for men, there wasn't much of a difference in this study, but for women, it did make a difference. They were much more motivated in the more neutral or non-stereotypical room, no, not feminine room, but neutral or non-stereotypical room than in the stereotypical room. And we replicated this many times um, with other, uh, not majors, but with teams and companies, organizations, and different types of groups. The main mediator that we have found for this has been feelings of fit and belonging, again, echoing the earlier presentations. Uh, it turns out that feeling that you fit with your prototypical image of uh, what a field is or who populates that field is very important in motivating interest and participating um, in that field. Other studies have found that um, there are stereotypes that scientists don't collaborate and that that can affect women. And, whoops. And, um, uh, and that emphasizing the ways in which the pursuit of science is a collaborative effort and instead of just a solitary one actually boosts women's inclination uh, to pursue a scientific career. So going back to something that Dr. Pitt said earlier, um, I think it behooves us to make an effort to understand what people's perceptions and stereotypes are of us. Um, as faculty, uh, but also of our field um, and of our department uh, and of our classes. How many times do you think about the posters that you put up in your office or the pictures that you put up in your office? Right? What are you communicating about who you are and what your field is and who populates your field um, with these subtle cues? Okay, the third one is going to be my closing. Um, the third assumption is that these problems are too entrenched, these imbalances are too entrenched or too difficult to do anything about. Um, and here I would say, don't think about what you can't do. Think about what you can do and then go and do it. Um, so some uh, general um, issues to think about. The first one is that leadership matters. Um, there's research suggesting that leaders with a diversity worldview who are sensitive to diversity positively affect diverse teams. And one thing that leaders can do is make diversity and inclusion a priority and create a sense of accountability um, and also value the organizational innovators, as Dr. Sonnert said, who do this work. Um, another one uh, is to uh, assign a person to be responsible uh, for diversity within your, say, department or a committee uh, to do so, so that you can do things like track belonging. Are people networked? Are they um, being mentored? Are they having the opportunities they need for success? A recent stu just out study from a colleague of mine at Berkeley suggests that um, in the first year of graduate school uh, in STEM uh, fields, uh, students of color and women are not publishing as much as their white male counterparts. Um, or the organizational sociology research, research suggests that these factors, things like creating a sense of accountability, having accountability structures, um, uh, 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 enforcing some kind of, or creating some kind of individual or committee responsibility for diversity, um, and uh, things like mentorship are the most um, effective in creating diversity. The next one is to collect and examine data. 
look at where the problems are. Are the issues with outreach? Are, are they with participation in these high school and college programs that Dr. Pitt were mentioning? Are they in the application process? Are they in the recruitment process? Are they in hiring? Are they in promotion? Are they in retention? Um, and then finally, take action. Uh, Harvey Mudd tripled its number of female computer science majors while that major, while numbers of women were declining uh, nationwide. Uh, and they credit research-based practices. So for example, they redesigned their gateway course to present more breadth and more basics. They presented mentored research opportunities to students early, to women, students in particular, early in their uh, undergraduate career. And they um, started an annual field trip to the Grace, annual Grace Hopper celebration. So in sum, um, there's no perfect recipe, there's a lot of challenges, and as my colleague said, it is difficult. But armed with a deeper understanding of the processes of diversity and inclusion, we can do better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Plow. Well, we have a little time now for questions. Uh, we have a very few minutes for questions. If anybody has a question or a comment. I have a question. Is this on? Hello? Sorry? It's on now? Oh, okay. Linda McGowan at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I just wanted to make a comment about fixing women versus fixing the system. The first comment is that um, I always find it curious that fixing the men is not included there as though somehow <laughs> men are not responsible in any way for the system. Uh, but, but even perhaps more importantly, I've been participating in these sort of conversations. This is not new, these considerations. Probably since the 1970s, so what is it, like 40 or 50 years? I think women have been sufficiently fixed or compromised or however we want to put it. I really think um, we need to really focus on the system at this point. I think to suggest that we still have to make those compromises so that our careers are not suffering, and I'm particularly looking at junior women, and I suppose to some, you know, and I, I'm, because I'm not familiar with it, I, but I suppose that this would also be relevant for minorities, some of whom are women. Um, you know, I, it, that's done. That's done. We need to move forward, specifically address the system, and stop thinking about the fixing part of it. Can I, can I respond? Yes, please. I, what I wanted to say, and what I still say, is this is not, it's not a dichotomy. Uh, it's, there are situations where uh, really one career is at stake very quickly and uh, uh, I think in that situation you have to be pra pragmatic and I, I agree with you uh, I'm I'm actually an advocate of f fixing the system and and I've uh, done research on that but I, I don't think you can you should you should tell a woman at that juncture in their career, no. Uh, we need, first we need to fix the system because uh, I, I, I think it's the, the, the time scale of an individual career is very sensitive. And, and I, completely, I completely understand that. I'm just, it, it's time, it's time. I mean, how much longer, how many more five to 10 year periods do we need of that? It, it's, it's well past time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not against it. I, I've just, yeah. The next question. Um, so my name's Pia, and I'm an undergraduate student, actually, um, at the University of Texas. Um, we have a 3% black population at my university, and I've noticed that, especially in science, oftentimes women of color experience things differently than white women. Um, what, and I think that science and the way that we talk about science has a role in that. Even like on Monday at the planetary protection session, we had people saying that planetary protection didn't matter, that contamination in space was okay. And this was after there was like an Apache hoop dance the day before, which I think empirically shows that like colonization 
has been a problem. Uh, like we have used science to support things like eugenics. We've used science to support things like um, transphobia. So how do you think that like we can create a diverse environment in science when people aren't willing to question the ways in which we produce our knowledge to form science? I, I apologize, everybody. We're over time now, and they need to transform the rooms for the next sessions, but we do have a break coming up, so I'd invite all of those who have questions to come up and perhaps discuss them with our panelists. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and... and <laughs> yes, um, before everybody takes off, um, we had one last uh, thing to mention here. Um, we don't want to leave on a, a depressing note. Um, and so what I want to invite everybody to do is to go back to your institutions and do something. Take at least one small action, one takeaway point from our speakers that you think you can make a difference with. And I learned this uh, myself as a parent that you don't have to be a perfect parent all the time. In fact, a colleague in child development said, you only have to be a good parent, a perfect parent, 5% of the time, which seems like a staggering low number <laughs> from a professional. But go out and do something. Those little changes do make a difference. And feel free to meet with us uh, after the session here. Thank you. <laughs>